And now, here is Debbie Kaplan, board member. Good morning, everybody. We are an intentionally multi-generational, multiracial, multicultural, inclusive, and anti-oppressive religious community. You're welcome here. We invite you to fill out the guest connection card that you'll see if you click on the chat. We want to be able to support your, your exploration of what's available in our community that interests you and how you might participate. Welcome. Now, before we begin our worship service, we have a few reminders. After today's service, newcomers are invited to join a breakout room from the coffee hour where Janet McFarland will host a newcomer's welcome and introduction. Also, Heather McLeod will help you sign up for the UUA's Eco Challenge Drawdown, which is a very exciting environmental program that I hope to tell you more about as the service progresses. And now will you join us in the chalice lighting? We light this chalice today, symbol of Unitarian Universalism, in part as a celebration of COVID-19 vaccines that bring us closer to being together in person. And we commit to health and safety for everyone, leaving no one behind. If your microphone is not muted, please mute it. We light our Black Lives Matter candle. We light this candle in recognition of the Black Lives Matter movement and in recognition of the systemic racism that tries to deny the full humanity of Black people. And we commit to dismantling it with daily action. And we light our peach peace candle. These are the words of Reverend Al Sharpton from his eulogy for George Floyd. We light the peace candle today, holding these words in our heart and saying with love and reverence the names of people lost to racist violence, gun violence, and the place where these two intersect. Adam Toledo, Dante Wright, Matthew R. Alexander, Samaria Blackwell, Amarjeet Johel Jasvinder, Kaur Jasvinder Singh, Amarjeet Sekon, Carly Smith, John Weiser, Matthew Zadok Williams. The movement won't rest until we get justice, until we have one standard of justice. Your family is going to be ours. Your family is going to miss you, George, but your nation is always going to remember your name because your neck was one that represented all of us and how you suffered represented our suffering. So we are going to lay you near your mama now. You called for mama. We're going to lay your body next to hers. But I know mama has already embraced you, George. You fought a good fight. You kept the faith. You finished your course. Go on and get your rest now. Go on and see mama now. We're going to fight on. 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 And now Jeffrey Melcher, our environmental educator, I have a poem that I found called All Water is One, which is a beautiful reference that holds all of the, the things that have been spoken and those that have not been spoken and still hold held in the silent sanctuary of our heart. All Water is One by Mel Hoover and Rose Eddington. Water unites us. All water is one. Shape shifting as it goes on and on in its unending cycle. The stream we gather by unites us with all the waters of the world, for all of life depends on water. That's why this common, everyday element on which our very lives depend is sacred. In our thankfulness for water, let us remember to honor, cherish, and care for it for our own lives, for all life touched by water, and for those who come after us. 
and knowing that each of the people that we have honored and spoken of, we have shared waters with all humanity. I would like to um, introduce uh, the next, there's a hymn, uh, music by Susan Ketter and Will, uh, Renee Wilton. Um, please mute your microphones, and if you'd like to sing along in your homes to For the Beauty of the Earth, please do. Susan Kiter, that was lovely. One of the best things a human being can experience is a spring day, warm and rife with greens and bees. We can feel the energy moving. Ah, spring day. And the Unitarian Universalist seventh principle is one of my favorites. It tells us to respect the interdependent web of existence of which we're a part. In today's service, the Earth Justice Advocates will be a chorus of voices saying what we love about the Earth, saying what challenges threaten this love, and saying what we can do about these challenges, individually and together, as a spiritual act. We seek to engage your minds, your hearts, and your wills for the benefit of our beloved community, which we are always building. To start, Heather McLeod offers a prayerful reflection. Please join me in prayer and feel free to let the words roll off of you where it is not your prayer. God, known and unknown to us in many names and many forms, source of all, ever loving parent, bringer of life and also of death, we acknowledge your presence within, among, and beyond us this day. We give thanks for the everyday miracles, the way buds swell and burst forth from bare branches, the effortless beat of our own hearts. We give thanks for the ways our children change and grow 
and become their own specific selves. We give thanks for friends who make us laugh, who reach into our loneliness and find us. We give thanks for the way hope pokes up like a weed, seemingly small and fragile, yet capable of cracking concrete in its persistence. And we ask for your help, God, Great Spirit, Mother Earth, Father Sky, power greater than ourselves that whispers to the birds when it is time to migrate. We are struggling. We know that we are dangerously warming the planet. And we are afraid. We are caught in the inexorable machinery of a system that is melting the Arctic ice, raising sea levels, causing fires and mass extinction across the globe. The lush, yellowy, green boreal forests of Canada are bulldozed into lifeless pits of tar sands that are pumped through pipelines to burn and warm the planet yet more. We strive to come into right relation with the earth, but the most basic acts of our daily lives, feeding ourselves, transporting ourselves to work and visit family and friends, contribute to the rise in temperatures. We know this is happening, and we don't know how to stop it. We do the little things we can. We conserve water, we eat less meat, or maybe get solar panels or an electric car. We write postcards in defense of democracy, or maybe we tend a garden or plant a tree, or make a donation or write a letter to the editor or attend a protest. Yet we feel that none of these individual actions are enough. Those of us who have tried to stop using plastic have discovered that it is nearly impossible within the framework of our lives as they are to do this as individuals. We are battling powerful forces that fight to profit from the devastation of the earth. And we may lose. We may have already lost. We don't know how to join together as a species to change what we are doing. We don't know how to be the collective that flies in perfect symmetry like a flock of geese. Show us the way, O oh source of all. God, whatever, wherever, however, whoever you may be, help us imagine that we might do this because the imagination of the divine is larger than any of our individual imaginations. Who else could have imagined that a little worm on a leaf could become a butterfly, or a little fish could become a frog, or that an acorn could combine with water and sunlight to become an oak, that dirt could mix with water and sunlight to become lunch, that the outrage of thousands of people could become a force to change the Mississippi state flag and topple old racist statues, that the U.S. government could mail thousands of dollars to people simply because we need it. Give us faith to believe that a miracle is possible, the kind of miracle that happens when small things combine and become something completely different, the kind of miracle that occurs with water when so many small degrees of heat combine to turn water into steam, or when many postcards become votes in Georgia that become a qualitatively different Senate. May the process of taking small, seemingly insignificant united actions help us become something different, something more connected, something we cannot yet imagine from this place that we are sitting now. May we remember that change is the nature of the universe, that transformation is possible, and that we are always becoming together. Amen. And now, Clark Sanford. I'd like to talk to you about something hopeful. Yes, hopeful about climate change. It's called regenerative agriculture. Why am I excited? Because it is the first approach that I've heard about that is big enough in scale and technologically within our reach 
that would not just slow, but reverse climate change. We have been releasing huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, causing the climate effects you've seen. And our lakes and oceans are absorbing some of that carbon, which is in turn causing acidification and other problems there. But where is all that carbon coming from? From the earth, the ground, the plants, both in and on the soil. The bulk of our burning of fossil fuels is relatively recent since maybe the Industrial Revolution. For thousands of years before that, we've been stripping the land, doing a great job of turning our rich, lustrous topsoil into dead dirt, which then blows and washes away. Think of clear cutting, slash and burn, monoculture farming, silt laden rivers, dust bowls, sandstorms, desertification and the like. We put that carbon, we need to put that carbon back into the ground as plant material. We need to reclaim barren ground, turn dirt back into soil and create new soil. That soil needs a rich collection of plants and animals living in and on it to sustain and develop the soil. And in that process, it will then sustain all of us. This goes way beyond the old fashioned term of soil conservation to soil regeneration. Regenerative agriculture isn't new technology. It's historic farming and grazing practices rediscovered, reapplied and updated. Practices like crop rotation cover crops, not tilling the soil, terracing and swales to retain rainwater, mixed and diverse crops, natural fertilization and pest control. And these practices can be applied in your yard, in urban gardens, in city parks, local family farms, and large commercial agriculture. Here's an image to illustrate the different practices. Which do you think are sustainable? Besides capturing carbon in the soil and in the plants growing on it, regenerative agriculture offers many other benefits. It reestablishes biodiversity, improves the water cycle, lessens the farmer's dependency on single crops and decreases the need for artificial fertilizers and pesticides. And these practices often go hand in hand with organic farming, locally grown food, consumer, consumer supported agriculture, farm to table and other efforts focused on sustainability. What can you do? Well, use regenerative practices in your own yard. Don't turn the soil in your garden beds. Just get your bud plug out and dig holes for the seedlings you plant. Leave the rest of the uh, growing plants and fungi and worms in their place. Replace your concrete and stone with greenery where you can to retain rainwater. Diversify your plants and use natives that thrive locally. Support local farms and CSAs who are practicing regenerative agriculture. Shop at groceries and restaurants that source from farms practicing regenerative ag and encourage your local state and national government to develop green spaces and assist farmers with converting to regenerative agriculture. Want to learn more? Well, I recommend a documentary called Kiss the Ground. This film opened my eyes to this hopeful possibility. You can access it on Netflix or download a free screening kit from Interfaith Power and Light. That kit includes an invitation to attend a live webinar with the filmmaker 
and people from Interfaith Power and Light. Talk with the church's Earth Justice team. They have links to other videos and other resources that uh, you can explore. Search the web for regenerative agriculture. There, there's a lot of information out there. And now a reflection from Vanessa Warheit. My name is Vanessa Warheit. I'm sorry I can't be there with you today. For this Earth Day service, I've been asked to talk about something I love about the Earth and to offer suggestions for how to join the climate movement. And until recently, I might not have said this, but I love a blue sky. I had pretty much taken fresh air for granted until several years ago when my son and I spent 10 days in Delhi and the skies there were choked with coal smoke and there were times when it felt like we were breathing from an exhaust pipe. And then just a few years after that, we began to have smoke days here in California. And then last fall, it got so bad that the sky went dark and turned the color of blood. And I miss the days when I used to take the blue sky and fresh air for granted. I have been fighting for climate justice for 10 years now, after fighting the 10 years before that for racial justice. But that blood red sky really shook me to my core. I think it was, it was a reminder of something that I know, but would really rather put at the fringes of my consciousness, which is that we collectively teeter on the brink of a mass extinction event and that life as we have always known it is changing in cataclysmic and irreversible ways. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed by this. A host of defense mechanisms kick in to protect us from the enormity of the problem. Denial or deflection, or just a feeling like this is too big and this isn't my fault. And I'm gonna think about something else. And it's interesting and maybe not a coincidence that facing the climate crisis can feel a bit like facing systemic racism in both cases, none of us is to blame for the systemic problem, but all of us are responsible now for fixing it. So I like to recommend first, just allow yourself to talk about climate change with another person and let yourself feel the feelings that come up. Similar to facing systemic racism, it won't be comfortable. You may feel shame or anger, and eventually you'll probably end up at grief. I know I did. But if you let yourself feel these feelings and talk about them, you'll probably feel a lot better and it will be a lot easier to move into action. And it's true what they say, action is the antidote to despair. Action has absolutely gotten me through my own feelings of climate grief. And knowing that I have a part to play, whatever that might be, and I may never know, but I know I have a part to play at this singular moment in history, and that's what keeps me going. So if you're asking yourself, well, what part can I play? Here are a few suggestions for how to plug into the movement. First, as I already said, find someone to talk to. This stuff is scary and we need each other to get through it. Second, I recommend joining a group. This will give you community and accountability and it will really expand your impact. You could join our very own environmental justice advocates. We'd love to have you. And there are lots of grassroots groups now pressuring governments and corporations to enact ambitious climate policies, which is absolutely what we need. Especially right now at the federal level, we have so much being done and that we can do. And it's an incredible window of opportunity right now. And if you can, please fund these grassroots groups because climate solutions still receive just a tiny fraction of philanthropy dollars and most of that doesn't go to grassroots action. Since transportation is a big part of our emissions problem, I can personally recommend the California Bicycle Coalition, Walk Bike Oakland, the Electric Auto Association and the Transit Riders Union. 
There's also an exciting new initiative that needs support called Bay Area Seamless Transit. 350 Bay Area, the Sunrise Movement, the Climate Reality Project, Climate Change Makers, and Indivisible are also doing important work. Sorry for the BART noise. And all of these groups have opportunities to get involved. Pick one and start showing up. And then please join our UU Drawdown Challenge. It'll help you start making changes on a personal level. And then lastly, figure out how to maximize your own leverage. Each of us has connections, networks, resources, relationships. What communities can you activate? Who else can you bring into the climate conversation? But whatever you do, don't sit this one out. Reach out to us if you need help getting started because we need everyone right now and we need you. Good morning. My name is Jeff Melcher. I'm your new environmental justice educator and I'm happy to present to you a song that honors the soil from which all of our food comes. It's written by Steve Van Zant and performed by the Banana Slug String Band it's called Dirt made my lunch. Dirt made my lunch. Dirt made my lunch. Thank you, dirt. Thanks a bunch for my salad, my sandwich, my milk, and my munch. Cause dirt, you made my lunch. Dirt is a word that we often use when we're talking about the earth beneath our shoes. It's a place where plants can sink their toes in a little while a garden grows. Dirt made my lunch. Dirt made my lunch. Thank you, dirt. Thanks a bunch for my salad, my sandwich, my milk, and my munch. Cause dirt, you made my lunch. Farmer's plow will tickle the ground. You know the earth is laughed when wheat is found. The grain is taken and flour is ground. From making a sandwich to munch on down. Dirt made my lunch. Dirt made my lunch. Thank you, dirt. Thanks a bunch for my salad, my sandwich, my milk, and my munch. Cause dirt, you made my lunch. A stubby green beard grows upon the land Out of the soil the grass will stand Under hoof it must bow For making milk by way of a cow Dirt made my lunch Dirt made my lunch Thank you dirt, thanks a bunch For my salad, my sandwich, my milk and my munch Cause dirt, you made my lunch. Dirt, you made my lunch. Hi, my name is Petra Mensch and I attend the Boulder Valley UU Fellowship in Colorado. In eighth grade, I took part in my church's coming of age program at my mom's urging. It was a few days of sleep away at a YMCA camp in the mountains. And I remember little from most of it, but I remember vividly the two or three hour sit on a hillside where we were supposed to just sit and think and somehow magically we'd know what to write our credo statements about. I was skeptical going in and for the first half or so I had no idea what I was doing here. I tried to just enjoy the outdoors and think, but I kept worrying, what if it doesn't work? There was a point where I had been sitting sto still for so long that a bird, a brave little black-capped chickadee so small it could easily fit in a single cupped hand, came right up to me so close I almost could have reached out and touched it, but still no earth-shaking revelation came to me. I remember that just after that, a bunch of kids came over with bright plastic skirt squirt guns to have a water fight, and our guides had to interrupt our meditation to move us to a better, less chaotic spot. And it was there, in the dense coolness of a low-lying thicket, where the ground was spongy and soft and wet, that I was thinking about the birds and the kids 
and staring at a little piece of bright pink plastic ribbon, long forgotten in its place tangled among the twigs, that it hit me. There was a purpose to my life. A credo statement fluttering uncertainly in the back of my head, but growing stronger with every passing day. And now it came into crystal clear clarity right in front of me, and I knew I needed to fix this. It terrified me. It felt hopeless and daunting and way too much. But I knew then that I didn't care. I would do whatever it took to mop up the mess my species had collectively made, because I had to. I just had to. I'd always known about climate change, always felt the distant, looming threat that would one day destroy the world as I knew it. I'd always been scared, but distantly so. Now, I'm utterly terrified, but exhilarated, too, because there is no escaping anymore. There never has been. And we have to fix this, no matter how impossibly impossible it seems. This is my calling, my reason for living, and I will fix this or die trying, because that's what needs to be done. And that's who I am. And it's better to try and to fail than be left forever wondering if you could have succeeded. And uh, now I'll pass it on to Jack Macy. Hi. <clears throat> I'd like to start with expressing my gratitude for our earth and the web of life that sustains us. I rejoice in spring's rebirth with a profusion of blossoms and so many poppies covering our hills. And I give thanks for the water that flows from the mountains through the delta into the bay, giving life to so many. One of the threats to this web of life that creates environmental injustice is plastics. Last summer, Earth Justice Advocates invited our community to participate in a plastic-free July campaign, and we shared examples of what we can do to reduce plastics from what we buy to policies. We promote the film, The Story of Plastics, powerful, eye-opening, inspiring portrayal of the huge global impact and challenge of plastics and its connection to fossil fuel extraction and climate disruption and what activists are doing. Did you know that over 380 million tons of plastic are produced every year in the US, making use the most of over 200 pounds per person every year. Plastic subsidizes fossil fuel extraction and increasingly fracking and pipelines are dedicated to making plastic. Polluting plastic factories are disproportionately impacting people of color, indigenous and low income communities that perpetuates environmental racism. Rapid growth of plastics is driven largely by single use plastics used for just a few moments, things like plastic bags and foodware and other packaging. And that's only growing more dramatically during COVID. And only 9% of plastics are getting recycled. And most of that is not replacing other plastics. Over 9 million tons and growing of plastics are entering the ocean every year. And at that rate, Studies have projected that plastics could outweigh fish by 2050. And that includes synthetic textiles that are breaking down along with plastics into smaller and smaller pieces and become what's called microplastics. And these are being found everywhere, even in the most remote mountains and deep seas found in our drinking water and the food we eat, the air and in our bodies. A study estimates we are ingesting a credit card worth of plastic or 2000 tiny pieces every week. Plastics with their toxic life cycle has chemicals linked to cancer, infertility, hormone and development disruptors, and of course are being found in birds, marine and other wildlife. If we respect the interdependent web of life, we must open our eye, eye, eyes to that interdependence and what is happening and how we contribute to that and what we can do. That's a lot to take in and feel, even just on plastics, let alone everything else we're hearing about today. But there is good news. A growing international movement called Break Free from Plastics is working to break our addiction to plastics and single use. 
And I've been privileged to work over the years on this, uh, helping to pass the first plastic bag ban in San Francisco and 15 years ago with the zero waste program, helping Bay Area communities and beyond. It's given me hope. And it's really about switching away from single use, plastics included, uh, to reusables. Because other things like paper, fiber, aluminum, that are single use still deplete resources. Compostable, pla uh, compostable foodware and, and compostable plastics have their own challenges and problems. And a lot of the fiber that we're using on foodware actually has toxic chemicals, forever chemicals that don't break down. So reduce and reuse is better than recycling compost, even with energy and water that's used to clean reusables. And good news is it saves businesses money. Now, COVID health restrictions did pause sort of the bring your own reusables. Uh, but fortunately, evidence has shown that reusables are safe and that they don't transmit virus. In fact, it's just, there's just not service transmission. So now health orders are allowing people to bring their own bag, to bring their own cup and other reusables. And restaurants, as they come back in recovery, are moving more towards reusables. And there's even new models around reusable takeout and delivery. A really cool company called Dispatch Goods has stainless steel containers you can get your food in and they'll pick it up for you. So there is now a reopen with reuse campaign to encourage local venues to, re, to do reuse. So policies and innovation are spurring a reuse revolution and the Bay Area is hot for this. Systemic change has to come of course from laws that get companies to take responsibility. And we came really close last year for a transformative policy in, in California. Now there are like nine good bills going on. One, AB 1276 would require businesses to only give out accessories like utensils and condiment packets if it's asked by the customer and have to do on-site reusable dyeing. Another would stop e-commerce packaging like Amazon from using plastic envelopes, peanuts, bubble wrap, unless it's truly recycled. And there's a national campaign now to get a, pa a bill passed called Break Fee from Plastics Pollution Act. So there's lots of opportunities to support these and other bills and encourage you to call and write your representatives and check out the websites like Break Fee from Plastics for so many things we can do because we have choices in what we can do and support. And on this Earth Day, I encourage you to use less plastics and support policies for a healthier and just web of life. Thank you. And now on to Tom Smith. Hi, I was a farm boy through the fifth grade. I was either in the barnyard back in the woods or down by the creek. Birds, butterflies, and bugs were abundant. The night sky was brightly illuminated with, with the Milky Way. I enjoyed the outdoors. Clear air, clean water, dark, rich soil, and freshly garden-grown meals. Thanks, Mom. Unfortunately, living close to the Earth within its natural cycles has largely faded within our time. Big oil, sodas, conveniences, like pesticides, petrofertilizers, herbicides, plastics, the noisy trucks and cars. The inconvenient side of this oral truth is pollutants. Global warming, noxious fumes, and tiny particles that lodge in our lungs. We are addicted to oil. To break our addiction, we must commit to some inconveniences. I will talk about indoor air quality. We burn natural gas, that is methane, in our homes all the time, but it harms us in many ways. Methane is a greenhouse gas 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Oil wells, pumps, and huge networks of pipes, fittings, and valves that deliver gas to our homes leaks methane to the atmosphere. Gas leaks frequently cause fires, even explosions. Gas is dangerous. In our homes, we exhaust the exhaust from gas burning furnaces, hot water tanks, and clothes dryers are generally well ventilated. They simply dump their exhaust and soot into the atmosphere. Most gas cooking appliances, however, 
are poorly ventilated. Cooking with gas is a major indoor polluter. Children in gas cooking homes are 15 to 30 percent times more likely to have asthma symptoms. Even if you have a range hood, and many do not, it is likely inefficient and 40% of the time, the fan is not turned on. We must stop burning methane in our homes. To eliminate the methane hazard, Bay Area cities are requiring new homes construction to be electric only, no gas service. The next step is to transition existing homes to electric only. This will be a political challenge and a very expensive endeavor, but it must be done. The transition will create many jobs. We need thousands of trained workers to make our homes energy efficient, to manufacture millions of heat pump and induction appliances. Let's dismantle the pipes and install wires. The Oakland City Council supports the electrification efforts. Dozens of nonprofits are fighting to make the electrification transition equitable, where low income residents do not incur the cost to electrify. I volunteer with 350 Bay Area, but there are many other nonprofits, for example, Genesis, Camille, the Oakland Climate Action Coalition. East Bay Clean Power Alliance, they all support the just transition movement. They are, they all mean volunteers. So volunteer yourself. Now I introduce Brett Anders. In my more indulgent youth, I focus mostly on places of beauty high mountain meadows in the Sierras, vistas over the North Coast and so forth, and sought to protect them. But in time, I have come to appreciate beauty in all natural places and in its many forms, because beauty is everywhere on this amazing planet, if we look for it. I'm thinking now of the dusty, dry desert in the Central Valley, Kern County, for example, with some of the dirtiest air in the nation and where an orgy of fossil fuel extraction occurs. Oil wells like bobbing horses piled on top of each other as far as the eye can see. Right now, you don't have to work too hard to see beauty even there. Because I imagine carpets of green grasses with flowers popping, pollinators and birds busy with the glory of spring. This strained but beautiful place is the epicenter of our climate health emergency. This place, like so many others all over the state, is the home for people. People disproportionately of color living in the shadow of fossil fuel extraction and with the greatest exposure to the emissions. Earth Day is our opportunity to renew our commitments to the interconnected web. As a physician, I feel obligated to act beyond my office role to act for our health and our planet's health on a larger scale. And I have committed to work on climate now, every day, and with passion, because time is short and more action is required. One place where action is necessary is for California, and it's in the form of Senate Bill 467, written by the Vision Coalition on the front lines in the Central Valley and sponsored by Scott Wiener and Senator Limon to ban fracking and extreme extraction methods and mandate setbacks of 2,500 feet from oil wells and 
that are exposing homes, schools, healthcare, living and other living facilities. And as well, this bill has provisions for just transition for fossil fuel workers and well remediation. Uh, fossil fuel extraction is a major polluter generating the highest quantities of methane, the greenhouse multiplier, and plenty of tiny PM 2.5, the most health damaging air pollutant. Fracking and oil and gas extreme extraction generate additional surface and groundwater contamination. The health consequences are suffered more severely by people of color who live or work nearby and increased rates of asthma, pulmonary disease, stroke and heart attack, low birth weights and cancer prevail. You may have already heard that this bill died last week in the Senate Natural Resources Committee because of inaction by or saying no, Senator Eggman, Hertzberg and Hueso um, were thought that they would support it, they failed. And because of lack of support by Governor Newsom, as well as the strong voice of the fossil fuel industry. But not all is lost. The bill is coming back, it's being revived. It is being scaled back and the amended bill is going to focus on the 2,500 foot setbacks, the most important health aspect directly. So, I encourage you to join with over 120 environmental justice, labor and public health organizations to voice your support for this revived bill. But the time to act is this week. You can call these senators uh, and request that they redeem themselves and say yes for human health and planet health by supporting amended SB 467. So let's keep this bill alive. There's lots of other legislation out there, but I've included a few things uh, in a link uh, in the chat and we'll also make it available in other venues on actions you can take, legislative actions you can take for Earth Day and this week. Happy Earth Day. It's my privilege now to introduce to you uh, one of the esteemed elders, members of our church, who will give you an invitation to generosity. Please welcome Tom Haw. Hello. Well, I've been a member of this church, First Unitarian Church, for 43 years, <laughs> it's a long time. And I've seen considerable wonderful changes. First, we drove out the rats and removed the lead pipes from our running water. Then we got over $3 million from the city of Oakland, from FEMA, and also most importantly from you, you folks, the congregation. We gutted the east wing of our building, our church, and properly attached an empty hall's floors, which are separating from the walls. And, um, and then, we, went, then uh, we were ready to move on to the third campaign. <laughs> In the third campaign, we were uh, charged with trying to improve the uh, seismic condition for the sanctuary, which would have potentially collapsed in a, in a 6.3 earthquake. So uh, that took another $3 million. These numbers, I'm not making them up. You can audit our books, I welcome it. That's $6 million over a period of about, about maybe 10 or 10 years or less. And now I look at the dramatic sanctuary rafters from the Oakland Hills, that's where they came from, and her beautiful, strange, beautiful, beautiful stained glass windows from our church founders. And I marvel at the will of those who had assembled before us Today, we're confronted with an environmental imperative that we all know about. We've heard about it from our fellow uh, members of the congregation. And uh, this, this requires an action, an action from our religious community. 
our Unitarian principles instruct us, as we all know, that all of us are worthy. And in that context, it's significant to recognize the worth of all peoples by protecting the earth that we all share. Today on Earth Justice Sunday, we should ask ourselves, what sort of action should we take to behave in unison, to protect the earth for all people? Our religion supports many different faiths and we're proud of that. We hear the call from native ancestors, from humanists, from, from pagan worshipers, to name but a few of those who are worthy of our faith-based actions. And we are troubled by the lack of commitment to protect our environment by some politicians and some business leaders. And so we are called as an act of faith to redirect their actions. Accordingly, your Earth Justice team intends to partner with other Bay Area allies in this struggle. It's a big issue and we need help. As an example, many of our members are also actively involved in local climate change organizations. You've heard of some of them, one in particular that uh, I'm aware of and my, as is my wife is the East Bay 350, but there's many others. And we're gonna be reviewing the options for these organizations off that, they, that they can offer. And we're taking a look at how we can take a, select a powerful and respected uh, nonprofit and help them and work with them in our neighborhood. This building is a beautiful space under which we practice being a loving community within and beyond these walls. It is both a monument and most importantly, a vessel. It's a vessel under which we can practice our Unitarian faith with other like-minded organizations outside of these walls. But we need, we need to be very careful about who we select to help us out. And that requires a lot of review and we're prepared to do that. And this is part of what we envision doing in the next year with the Earth Justice Associates partnerships. The Earth Justice team is also blessed with a very, very vibrant politically active community here. We know that. And we realize that it takes a collective effort to help West Oakland communities address global warming. Some of the things that are important beyond, that are not just global warming, we already talked about regenerative farming. It's a wonderful opportunity for us, even in our backyards. And you've heard from Clark on that particular point. And recycling, you've heard from Jack Macy on that particular point. These are but a few of the vital causes which we can make a difference for here in Oakland. We can't do it all. We need to prioritize. And we need the help from other organizations. A portion of your community, your current contributions today will be designated to support these efforts. Can we count on you, you, to help this fast changing environment become and agree that we are really under a most beautiful environment that's in need of our love. So can we count on you to help support our mother earth? Can we count on you to help support our mother earth? Amen. One of the things we can do, of course, in addition to counting on you, is money. I think we all know that, and there will be offerings that I don't know how we do it, but I'm sure others do, and we can hear from maybe Jeffrey or others about our process for contributing to this movement and to our church. Thank you very much. Please join in saying our congregational commitment to the work of the church, church. Which is, which is weaving a tapestry, a tapestry of, of love, love we call we community. Call we dedicate, we dedicate ourselves, ourselves and these are our offerings. And now on a recording from the Crescendo Choir Octet of Pete Seeger's tune, My Old Brown Earth. To my
Ah, we're at the end of our service. We're lucky that our national UU denomination is sponsoring an environmental initiative called the Eco Challenge Drawdown. It offers a number of ways to participate. The Eco Challenge Drawdown, Heather McLeod will be available in a breakout room after the service to help you understand and sign up to participate in the Eco Challenge Drawdown. And if you have any trouble getting into the breakup rooms after the service, you can go right from coffee hour. You can write to the host in the Zoom chat and he will get you in. Coffee hour follows the service. Just stay on the current Zoom line. And finally, I'd ask Heather to give us a benediction. Sometimes by Shana Pugh, a Welsh female poet, just to provide context for the male-centered language. Sometimes things don't go after all from bad to worse. Some years, muscadel, a kind of grape, faces down frost. Green thrives, the crops don't fail. Sometimes a man aims high and all goes well. A people sometimes will step back from war, elect an honest man, decide they care enough that they can't leave some stranger poor. Some men become what they were born for. Sometimes our best efforts do not go amiss. Sometimes we do as we meant to. The sun will sometimes melt a field of sorrow that seemed hard frozen. May it happen for you. Go in peace, be at peace.